I, I do usually. But if you've got your Bibles and you turn to the book of Luke chapter 5, I'm going to just start at verse 1. And while you're turning there, I just want to give this time and this moment to give honor and give thanks to my pastor, Pastor Creasy, our first lady, the beautiful job that they're doing here, uh, being great leaders, inspired, just on fire for God. Hey, everybody don't have that. I thank God for that. Amen. And I thank God for y'all. Thank y'all for this opportunity because I couldn't do it without y'all either. And most of all, I got to thank God because I definitely couldn't do it without him. Amen. So Luke chapter 5 verse 1. And I got a few little scriptures here, so bear with me. But it says, And it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him, talking about Jesus, to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Jacinarit. I hope I said that right. I don't know. Verse 2 says, And saw two ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. Washing their nets, not washing, I guess. And he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. And now when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, Launch out into the deep and let down your net for a draught. And Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have told all night and have taken nothing. But nevertheless, at thy words, I will let down the net. Amen. We got to be more like Peter. And when they said, and when, and when they had this done, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes, and their net break. And they beckoned unto their partners, which were in the other ships, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled the ship so that they began to sink. And when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he was astonished and all that were with him at the drought or at the drought of fishes which they had taken. And so was also James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which were the partners with Simon. And Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. And when they had brought their ships to the land, they forsook all, and they followed him. And that was a lot of reading, but we're going to unpack it together. And if the Lord could help me tonight, and if y'all help me and get behind me, I'm going to preach a simple thought, a simple message to get out of the boat. Amen. Right. Pastor, will you pray one more time? Thank you, Jesus, for this opportunity to be here. God, God I thank you, Jesus, for this word that you've given me. Thank you, Jesus, for what you're doing in this place, Lord. Anoint your word, Lord. Touch me, God. Lord, use me, Lord. Let me be a vessel, Lord, a willing vessel. Have your way in this place, Lord. Minister to somebody tonight. In the name of Jesus, have your way, God. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, Lord, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. If you clap your hands, you can be seated. Amen. So y'all know me. I, I like to talk. And I like to, I like to pre, or I like to read the text, and then I like to go through and explain it. And I know y'all ain't elementary, but I am, so sometimes I just need some explaining. So if I need it, y'all getting it too. So like the story begins, we see Jesus standing on the shore preaching a message. Amen. A lot like Jesus. But while he was preaching, he had gathered such a good crowd that they begin to press up against him. They just begin to, they just begin to swarm him. And I feel like he must have been somewhat claustrophobic because he's like, man, I got I to I take some steps back. Amen. So he calls for one of the people in the boat. He sees them out there cleaning their nets. And he says, hey, can I get in your boat and teach? And so that's what he does. He gets in the boat and he starts to teach. Now, Peter... Sitting in the boat. Now, he's called Simon here, but Simon and Peter's the same person, if you didn't know that. So if I start talking about Peter and Simon, I'm talking about the same person. So don't get lost with me. But Peter and all of the disciples, well, not all of the disciples, John and uh, James, they're sitting in the boat and they're listening to Jesus preach and talk to the big crowd out there. Because to give you, give you an idea, here's the boat and there's the land. And he's just sitting and he's teaching and he's talking. Now, when he gets done talking, he looks at Peter and he says, Let's go on out into the deep a little bit, and let's see what we can catch. That's right. Amen. But Peter, he tells Jesus, hey, we've been out there all night looking for fish. We've been out fishing all night long. But if you want us to go out there, we'll go out there one more time. Yeah. Amen. When I read that, I got to thinking, I got to be more like Peter. Yeah. Amen. Because when we hear the word of God, 
And we feel God moving and pressing us to do something. We always want to come up with an explanation of why we can't do it. Well, God, I can't do that. God, I, I've done that, and I've done this, and I've tried this, and I've tried that. And, and I don't want to just keep trying it. I don't want to look crazy. Every time Brother Creasy preaches the word, I go up and pray, and it just seems like nothing happens. But God is pressing you to go on and do it again. Hey, Peter said, hey, we went and we told all night, and we didn't catch anything. But I believe, and this is just me, after hearing what Jesus taught about, whatever it was he taught about, he thought something is different about this guy. So if he tells me I need to go back out there, I need to go back out there. So like the story said, he pushed his boat on out there, casted the net down, and caught so many fish that the net began to break, and another boat had to come, and they had to take all the fish in, and the boats began to sink. Amen? But that's not even, where, that's not even my sermon for tonight. Amen? But what I got out of that, out of that first part, was when we hear the word of God, we need to move our feet. Amen. We can't just sit around and just wait for God to do something if we're not willing to do nothing either. God ain't going to do it all. God wants us to take a step of faith. Amen. It was a step of faith for Peter to go back out there. He had been out there all night. You know what it's like when you get off work after all day. You definitely don't want to do anything else. But he said, hey, I'm going to do it. And they caught. Literally a boatload of fish. Amen. So what I got out of that is if you would just obey the word of God. And when God is pressing you to move, you might get more than you bargained for. You might find more than what you thought you needed. Amen. Because God is not just a little God, but he's a God of a whole lot. Amen. But that's not even my sermon, like I said. And I'm, I'm already off track. You know, I always get off track when I get up here. I always get off track. But we got to quit giving God excuses. We got to quit telling God what can and can't happen. Amen. We got to stop telling the creator how we're created. We need to stop. Because when we say, God, I can't do that, we're not putting limits on us. We're putting limits on God. Because it's not us that does it anyways, Pastor Creasy. It's God that does it. All we got to do is obey. And if God's not going to do it through me, he'll find somebody else that will. I'm not special. I'm not perfect. Amen. But where I want to focus at tonight is we see the calling of the first disciple. Peter, James, and John. And Jesus tells them in another part, uh, in one of the other Gospels, he says, I'm going to make you fishers of men. Amen. Now, if you know the story of James and John, they had a, a, a dad called Zebedee, and you hear James and John, the son of Zebedee, quite a few times. And when you read through um, in different Gospels, it talks about Zebedee being a fisherman, right? So more than likely, James and John had been up fishing all of their life. That's probably all they knew. Amen. They were probably like me. I grew up around my dad doing HVAC. And I thought, when I get older, I'm not going to do HVAC. I promise, I'm not going to do it. But when I got out into the real world, I found out what was more comfortable. And I thought, well, I know more about that than I do this. So I think I'm just going to try that. So that might have been where James and John was. They said, hey, this is what daddy did. This is what we're going to do. So they find this partner named Peter. Peter's also a fisherman. Now, these are skilled fishermen. They're not out there just to have fun, right? They're not out there wetting a the hook. They're out there making a living. Now, they got, they got to do this to pay the bills, put food on the table. So they know what they're doing. They're professionals. But this man comes up, and he preaches this sermon to all of these people on the, on, the, uh, on the shore. And then he tells them to go out. They catch all these fish. And then he says, you're no longer a fisher of, or, or fisherman, but you're going to be a fisher of men. And Pastor Creasy, what I like about that is, I don't read any scripture where they say, no, nah, I'm okay. I think I'm just going to stay here. Right? I think I'm just going to do this. See, a lot of times we mess up because we want to stay with what we're comfortable with. We want to stay where we're at and say, we say, God, move a mighty way in my life. God, use me, Lord, use me. But when God calls us out into the uncomfortable, we got a hard time stepping out. we got a hard time dropping our nets and saying, hey, I'm going to follow this guy. Amen. And I'd be the first to admit I'm the same way. Sometimes I get uncomfortable. I, I get uncomfortable a lot. Y'all don't know it, but I'm kind of a shy type, especially when it's people that I don't know. Y'all are saying, I don't see how that is, but, but I am. And I'll give, you, I'll give you an example. Now, Sister Teresa, I, I don't want to embarrass you, but, uh, but a couple weeks ago, we went out to Margarita's. And we had decided to just get together and just have a good time, eat some 99-cent tacos, and just go on about our merry way. But if you don't know Sister Teresa... She is just the most loving and the most caring lady you'll ever meet. Like, when I think of a woman of God, I can think of Sister Teresa. But if you also don't know Sister Teresa, she's bold. 
And I thank God for that boldness. But she's bold. And she'll go up to anybody and she'll talk to anybody and she'll just, it, it don't matter. She don't meet a stranger. And that's how we're supposed to be. I'm not, I'm not casting shade on that at all because I'm the, I'm the complete opposite. I'm just going to keep my mouth shut and I'm going to wave and I'm just going to keep walking. But we go into Margarita's. And there's a table behind us, and it's probably, I don't know, 15 people back there. And they got a birthday party going, and they're just, they're just having a good time. They're just getting with it. And uh, they come out, and, you know, they're, they're doing a little Mexican restaurant, happy birthday song and whatever. And we're at our table, and we're singing happy birthday to them and carrying on. And then we just go on about our business, minding our own business. Well, Sister Teresa, she already then asked the waiter his name. She said, I want to get to know you on a personal level. And I'm sitting there. I'm not going to lie. I'm just going to be honest with y'all. I'm over there, like, sliding under the table because I'm like, I don't talk to people. Like, I, I don't do this. I don't do that. But just to get off on a sidetrack, when I go to Margarita's, I see Brother Alex. And when I walk in, he says, hey, hey, hey. And I say, how you doing, Brother Alex? And I'd have never, I'd have never spoke to him if it would have been for Sister Teresa. So stepping out of the comfort zone is... That's what God wants us to do, amen? God didn't call us to be comfortable, but the story don't even end there. They get up, and they start to walk out of the restaurant, and Sister Teresa, she calls the, the birthday girl over, and she says, come here, I want to sing happy birthday to you. And I'm thinking, Lord, I'm thinking, I'm, I'm over here sweating, and I'm thinking, she, I, I'm so embarrassed, and I'm, I'm going to be honest with y'all. It was a table full of white people, and when she asked her to come over and us sing happy birthday to them, the lady gave us kind of a reluctant look. She was like, uh, but she was like, okay. So she came over there, and Sister Teresa said, I want to sing happy birthday to you like our church sings happy birthday to you. And she said, okay. So she starts singing, and she gets a few words in, and I'm thinking, this lady's ten times bolder than I would ever be, so I, can't, I at least can't let her sing by herself. So I join in. Sister Abby joins in. Sister Elizabeth, Brother Noah, we all join in, and we just sing happy birthday to her. Happy birthday to you. Um, I can't even remember how it goes. Every day of the year, may you feel Jesus near. And just a simple birthday song. And when I looked up, this lady, she began to cry. She had tears in her eyes. And she said, that is the sweetest thing I've ever felt. N nobody's ever done anything sweet for me like that. And then when I looked up, the whole other group who were reluctant to come over there, they were standing around, and they were crying. And they started asking, what, what church do y'all go to? I want to come and be a part of something like that. So I'm standing, I'm talking to them. I'm, uh, uh, my wife hands me a church card, and we're telling them, you know, y'all come on, y'all come on. And one of them says, she points at her skin, and she says, are we allowed to come to y'all's church? And I'm like, anybody can come to the house of God, amen. But I said all that to say this. Sister Teresa took me out of my comfort zone. To me, that's not comfortable to me. And you might think that you might have to stand behind a pulpit or that you might have to be at a camp meeting or that you got to have some evangelist to reach people with the Word of God. But sometimes all it takes is a birthday song and to say, hey, Jesus loves you and I love you. Amen. God calls us out to be uncomfortable. Amen. Not to sit on a pew with our arms crossed and say, hey, every Sunday I come and I did my part. I clap my hands and I did whatever. Hey, it might be as silly as singing a birthday song. But if God called you out to do it, we we got to drop our nets and say, hey, I'm going to do it, God. Amen. It blessed me and it changed me for sure. But a lot of times God puts a calling on our life. And it might not always be preaching. That's usually what we think. Oh, it's preaching, it's singing, it's piano playing, it's whatever. And I thank God for that. Those are callings. But sometimes a calling don't always look like that. But when God calls us out, being the people that we are, we want to say, hold on, God. Let me check what all that entails. Let me look that up on Indeed and see if that really fits my personality. And we try to shape what God has for us. When God's trying to shape what he's got for us, amen, we can't shape God. God's got to shape us. When we start shaping God, we're going to be in trouble, amen. So we got to stop trying to tell the creator how we're created. We got to stop saying, God, I can't. And say, God, you can. God, you say, God, it's impossible. But God's saying, I'm possible. If we would just give him the chance, amen. But for the next few minutes, I'm going to talk about this man named Peter. Now, if I was to ask, probably by a raise of hands, out of all the people in the Bible, who would you relate to the most? Most of us would probably say King David. That's what most of us would probably say. Some of us might say something different. But most people say, I like King David. I can relate to King David. And me personally, I think that's because all of David's mistakes and all of his mess-ups and all of his trips up, trip-ups are recorded in the Bible. Right. Amen. 
He was bold enough to write down all the times he messed up. Hey, we being perfect, holy men and women of God, we don't want nobody to know our mistakes. Oh, no, I, yeah, I, ain't nobody going to know what I did. Ain't, ain't nobody going to see what God brought me from. But if we was to put our mistakes out there, we would be surprised how relatable we are to one another. We look at people like Pastor Creasy and we say, I can, I can never get to the standard Pastor Creasy's at. God can never use me like Sister Creasy, like, like God uses Sister Creasy. God can never do that, but you'd be surprised what God can do. You'd be surprised what God has brought people like Pastor Creasy from, like people like Sister Creasy and brought me through. You'd be surprised how God turned around these mistakes in our life. But a lot of people say, I like David because he just airs it out there. Amen. Now, I ain't telling you to air your laundry out, but I'm just saying. Sometimes if we was honest, we'd find out we connect with people a lot better than we think we do. Amen. But David is pretty relatable. I can say he's relatable to me. But as a young, wild teenager that I was, when I started reading through the Word of God, I, find, I kind of found a connection with Peter. I like Peter. Now, if you don't know the story of Peter, you might only know Peter is the one that preached on the day of Pentecost. Or you might know Peter from the epistles, right? You might know Peter doing all of that great work. But when you read through the gospel and you see Peter in the gospel, you, you see kind of a different light of Peter. Peter was a rambunctious type. He was, he was ambitious for sure. He was very zealous to say the least, amen? Most of the time, he liked to talk too much. And he had that foot and mouth syndrome, meaning that he put his foot in his mouth a lot of times. And he, just, he wasn't shy of words. And when everybody else didn't have nothing to say, Peter had something to say. And when nobody else wanted to dive in head first, Peter was going to dive in head first. And most of the time it got him in trouble. But when I looked at Peter, Peter was like a dog behind a fence, like a vicious dog. And just barking and growling and carrying on and just waiting for the opportunity just to pounce on somebody. If you think back to when they come to arrest Jesus, you know, he pulls out the sword and cuts the man's ear off. And he's like, you know, y'all ain't taking him, right? He, he's just ready to go, right? But like I said, sometimes he talked too much too. Now, I don't know about y'all, but when I read the story about the storm and when Peter says that that's you out there on the water, call me out there, right? And Jesus calls him on out there. Now, I'm not sure. It doesn't just go into full detail, but I feel like Peter probably wasn't too serious. Peter was just kind of running his mouth and said, well, if that is you, let me come out there. And when God said, come on, he thought, man, I should have kept my mouth shut, right? That's, that's how I feel. I'm that way, right? But as a teenager, I found myself being relatable to Peter. In high school, I wasn't that tall of a person. My sophomore year, I was like 4'9". I weighed like 90 pounds. So all the time, I had a target on my back. People always wanted to pick on me. And I learned how to wrongly embrace <laughs> all of that uh, attention, right? And I learned how to wrongly embrace the wrong attitude amen because people would come up and they would say things and a lot of times they probably meant it as a light joke but I was ready to fight like no questions asked I'm punching I didn't care right I was kind of like Peter I was just ready to go it didn't matter so I was pretty good at running my mouth too amen I could run my mouth with the best of them and my dad has told this story a hundred times but my dad always tells a story about my brothers and uh all of my older brothers, let me put that in there. And the neighborhood we lived in, we had a bunch of kids outside provoking them about some type of matter. And I look out across the yard, and I see all these guys out there, and it looks like they're just trying to provoke my brothers. So I run out there, and Sister Creasy, I didn't ask what the problem was. I didn't say what's going on, how can we work this out. I just walked up, and I said, who wants to fight? Y'all want to fight? Y'all ready to fight? You know. So that's the type that I was. I, was just, I, I didn't ask no questions. I was just ready to fight. And I was, I've always been like that. Now, I thank God that he's delivered me from that. He, he has. I thank God for that. But I've always been like, I've, I was able to relate to Peter because I didn't think. I just did a lot of times. I, and a lot of times, it was stupid. There was many times I went to the principal's office, and he would sit me down, and he would have me in this chair and the other guy in this chair, and he'd say, both of y'all stand up. And that guy would stand up, and then I'd stand up, and he'd say, what was you thinking? I'm trying to fight him? He's twice your size. And I would say, well, who's crying, me or him, right? So it, it didn't matter. So when I started reading through the Bible and I seen somebody like Peter, I thought, man, I, I kind of like this guy, right? Another story, and, and I'm not trying to boast about my, my bad habits and my mistakes that I had, but, but another story is when we lived um, 
In another neighborhood, we had this young man that always come and he always started trouble and just always, he started out as a friend and one of those that turned into like an enemy. Y'all, y'all know how it is as kids. You can't get along too long. And he would always come into the yard and tear stuff up and just always causing a problem. And one day, I walk into the kitchen, and I see all my brothers gathered at the window. And I'm like, what's going on? And they're like, he's out there stealing our go-kart. He's literally pushing it out of the yard. And they're like on the phone trying to call our dad, trying to call the police, the whole thing. And me, I just go out the side door. And lo and behold, my dad, a couple days before, had ran over a water hose in the yard with a lawnmower. So on my way out there, I pick up like a four-foot piece of sun-dried water hose. And now, I'm like sixth grade and this guy's in high school and I can remember it to this day he had on this little tank top wife beater like shirt and these little bitty probably six inch long gym shorts and I go to town on him and I'm just whipping and whipping and to the to the point he's laying on the ground in the fetal position crying and I'm just hitting him hitting him hitting him and my brothers are standing in the background and they're like no 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 and then I take the go-kart and I push it back into the yard and I'm like I don't know who he thinks he is well it wasn't long until the cops showed up right Cops are knocking on the door, and they're questioning my older brothers right off the bat. You know, I know that, that y'all assaulted this young man, blah, 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 and I want to know who's responsible. And so then they push me up, this little, like, three-foot-tall little boy, and they're like, he did it. And I'm like, yeah, I did it. I was tired of him messing with us and stealing our, stealing our go-kart and all of that. You know, that's just the type of person I was. And, and I'm not condoning fighting, and I'm not condoning running your mouth. But, and like I said, I thank God that he delivered me from that. Amen. I thank God that now when I find myself in a situation like that, I found patience. I find that in God. I mean, it's nothing that I've done, but it was God. But when I begin to read the Bible, where it all started at, is when I begin to read about Peter who had a big mouth and was just ready to jump in with both feet, no questions asked. I thought to myself, Brother Creasy, if God can use somebody like Peter, then there's hope for me. If God can use Peter with the big mouth, God can use Sam with the big mouth too, right? So I thank God for that. So Peter become pretty relatable to me. And so, like I said, Peter was the type to just go in with both feet. He didn't care. When, when he saw, saw Jesus out there, he said, if that's you, call me out. And he got called on out there, and it wasn't long till he started sinking, amen? And in another place, you see where, where Jesus, he starts talking about his death. And Peter says, oh, it's not going to happen. That, that's not going to happen. I'm not going to let that happen, right? I'm going to step in the way. I'm going to be the big dog. I'm not going to let that happen to you, Jesus. I'm going to take care of you, right? And Peter, or God, or Jesus rebukes him. And in another place, when he talks about that he's going to go, and when he goes to be crucified, everybody's going to leave him. Peter stands up and says, if everybody else leaves you, I'm not going to leave you. They might leave you, but I'm not going to leave you. And Jesus tells him, before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. Three times. But like Peter, when a call was put on my life, I was eager to answer it. Although Peter was hard-headed and had a big mouth, When Jesus said, you're now fishers of men, it didn't take long for him to drop that net and say, hey, I'm coming with you, right? Forget about all the fish we just caught. We got two boats of fish back here, but I'm following you. I don't care. That's old news right there. So if y'all don't know, at a very young age, probably seven, eight years old, it was prophesied that I was called to preach. And I was excited about it. Even at a young age, I was like, I can't wait. And like I told most of y'all still, I was dumb, and I thought, well, when that time comes, I'll just have all this knowledge and all this know-how and all this wisdom, right? God's just going to bestow it on me like he did Solomon. But it it didn't happen that way. So if God's calling you to something, you better get to work. Amen? You better tell God how eager and how how willing you are to do the work because it takes work. It's not easy. He didn't say, come with me down Rainbow Lane. No, he said, pick up your cross and carry me, right? So living for God's not always easy. But also, like Peter, although I was eager, in a sense, I made a lot of mistakes along the way, too. And if we're all being honest, we can say, me too. <laughs> and I have a lot of I could hads and I should hads. I could have done this. I should have done that. I could have went out there and, and kindly asked that boy to stop stealing our go-kart. I should have not went out there with a piece of water hose. But not even that other mistakes in my life that I could have, I should have, right? In Matthew 16, I just talked about it. Jesus starts to tell them of his death. But Peter in verse 22 says, Be it far from thee, Lord, 
It shall not be unto thee. It's not going to happen. I'm going to be there. I'm not going to let that happen. It was also Peter in Matthew 26 when uh, he said, everybody's going to abandon me. Peter said, they might, but I'm not. I'm not going to abandon you. Even if they do, I'm not going to do it. And like I said, Jesus told him, before the rooster crows, you'll deny me three times. Sometimes we say that, and even then, Peter said, I won't deny you. I promise I'm not going to deny you. I'm not going to do it. And a lot of times we make promises to God. And I I believe we have good intentions. I, I had good intentions, Brother Creasy. I had good intentions to live for God. I had good intentions to to be what God had called me to be, but I made mistakes along the way. And we all do. And Peter was no different than we are. That's what I love about the Bible, because when I I read through the Bible, I read about these men and women of God, I can see when they messed up, when they dropped the ball, God still had mercy. God still showed them grace. Amen. Peter said, I'm not going to deny you. I won't do it. I promise I won't do it. But it's not long in Matthew 26, verse 69, where we see Peter's confronted outside of the palace about being with Jesus, and he says, I don't know what you're talking about. I have no idea what you're talking about. I don't don't know that man named Jesus. I don't know. And then again on a porch, a lady comes to him and says, I've seen you with Jesus. I, I know you. You've got to be one of them. I've seen you with them. And the Bible says Peter swore said, I don't know the man. Don't know the man. Then a third time, somebody approaches him and says, I know you. You were walking with Jesus. Because I can tell by the way you talk. Your speech betrays you. You speak like one of them Galileans. I I know you was with Jesus. And the Bible says that Peter curses and swears and says, I don't know the man. I don't know what all he said. But it probably wasn't pretty. And he said, I don't know him. And that third time, the Bible says immediately, it flashed through his mind the words of Jesus. That said, he, well, he heard the rooster crow. I left that part out. And it said immediately, it flashed through his mind the words of Jesus that said, before that rooster crows, you'll deny me three times. And the Bible says that Peter went out and he wept bitterly. He was heartbroken. He had messed up. To him, beyond all repair. We don't really hear a lot about Peter after that. After that, he kind of just runs off because of his mistakes in this moment. And I can just imagine the guilt and the hurt that he felt. Because the same Peter with the big mouth that said, I won't do any of that. I'll never do that. I'll be there with you. When they come to take you, I'll stand in the way. But they took him. And when everybody else denies you, I won't. But he denied him. Could you imagine the hurt, the guilt that Peter felt? In his heart, I believe he fully wanted to follow Jesus with everything he had. He wanted to follow him to the end. But now he's messed up. And I can only help but think that he was thinking, I can't come back from this. My mistakes are too many. God will never forgive me. Amen. And the reason why I feel like Peter said that is because I've been there too. He'll never trust me again. He'll never put a call on my life. He'll never use me again because I've made too many mistakes. I've I felt that way, Brother Creasy. I've been there. And maybe you have too. And it's a bad feeling. It's, it, nothing hurts worse than knowing that you failed God. A few weeks ago, I had one of the young men in, in our youth class. Excuse me. I wish he was here tonight because he asked a question, a a very bold question. He said, we were talking about, we were doing a lesson about God forgiving. God forgiving sin, God forgiving mistakes. And he asked me, he said, Brother Sam, what's the worst mistake you ever made? And I thought, well, I'll get back to you on that and I'll let you know. You know. And honestly, I, I began to think about it. Over the next week or so, I began, I began to think, what was my worst mistake, right? What's the worst thing that I've done? Now, I, I got a list. I got a list of stuff that I've done. So I started to flash it through my mind. Was it all the fighting, Brother Creasy? 
Was it the bad mouthing that I did? Was it was, was it the lying? Was it the was it the cheating? Was it whatever that I had done? Was it when I betrayed that person and I felt so sick to my stomach that I didn't eat for like a week and I couldn't even get out of bed? Was was that my worst mistake? But it wasn't long till I realized what my worst mistake was, Brother Creasy. And most of you know that most of my life I've grown up in church. I've grown up in the apostolic truth. I, I've known it. Amen. And I've known that I had a calling on my life since I was seven or eight years old. I've known that. But when I got to think about my worst mistake, I began to think about my time at school. And I began to think about, although I knew the Word of God. Now, I didn't know everything. I was a kid, right? I, I didn't know all the, all the technicalities, and I didn't know all the theology. But I knew right from wrong, and I knew when I was doing right, and I knew when I was doing wrong. And I knew that there was a God, that He could save you. And if you were heartbroken, He could heal you. And if you were going through problems, He could deliver you. Hey, I've seen miracles. I've seen signs. I've seen all of this. Yeah. Amen. And it, it was great. At a young age, people go a whole lifetime and not seeing some of the things I've seen. And I praise God for that. But my worst mistake, when I begin to think about it, is during that time, I never told anybody about God. I never told anybody about the gospel. And when I began to think about my worst mistake, I, I thought about a really good friend that I had in school. He rode the bus with me. And I remember, and now I knew better, I remember him getting on the bus sometimes, and he would look tired, and he would look worn out. Now, we were middle school age, 6th, 7th grade. And he just, he'd fall asleep. We had assigned seats together, so that's how we become best friends. But he would get tired, and he would fall asleep, and he just looked like he was just going through the ringer at, in sixth grade. Nobody should be looking like this guy looked. He was just, he was down on his luck. So one day I began to ask him. I thought, man, what's wrong with you? Why are you always tired? Why are you always going through this? And Brother Creasy, he began to tell me about his home life. He began to tell me about the things that he struggled with, that his house struggled with, his home struggled with. He began to tell me how his mom had got involved in witchcraft. And it got involved with all this demonic stuff. And that her mind had left her. And that she was casting spells and doing witchcraft and going crazy. And he would get on the bus and he would tell me these stories about his father mistreating him. And his, his mom having to go to a mental hospital because she was being tormented. And he just couldn't sleep at night because of all the things that he was going with, going through. And he was telling me all of this. And at this age, I had seen the devil be cast out of people. I've seen some, some miraculous things. I, I'd seen it firsthand. But the worst mistake I ever made is I sit there and I never said a word. The whole time when he would cry and he would pour out his life to me and tell me all the things he was going through, the whole time I sit there with the key in my hand, having the answer to what he needed, and I never told him because I was too uncomfortable. I never told him about what God could do. I never told him about how God could deliver his family from that situation. How God could deliver him. How God could give him joy. How God could bring him out of that darkness. And he would tell me almost every day. And I remember one day he got on the bus and he had not been at school for a while. And he got on the bus and he was all upset. And, and I said, what, what's wrong? You know, what's wrong with you? And he said, man, it, it happened. And I said, well, what happened? And he said, my mama she died. And I don't know what to do. <laughs> and even at a young age, I felt God pressing me to talk to this young man. But you know what I did? I stayed with the boat. I stayed with what I was comfortable with, and I never told him anything. I never gave him any direction. I never, never said that, hey, God... God can heal that brokenness. God can heal that hurt. God can heal that pain. I didn't do what God had called. I knew that I was called, but I didn't do it. And it wasn't but just a few years later that I found out that himself, him, he himself also died of an aneurysm. And a few weeks ago when I was thinking about my worst mistake, I couldn't help but think about this young man and his family and how I sit there and I never did what God called me to do. Because I was busy thinking that, well, my ministry is behind a pulpit. I already know what God's got planned for me. But I stayed in my boat, Brother Creasy. I stayed with what I was comfortable with. I stayed with, I don't want to look like a weirdo. I don't want to lay my hands on this kid and pray for him. I don't want to do that. But when I look back now, 
and I know who God is and what God can do, I think if I could just go back and lay my hands on that young man, if I could just pray for him and pray for his family and say, God can deliver you. Instead of listening to all that worldly music we listen to on the bus, I should have been giving him a Bible study. Amen. I should have been doing what God had called me to do. There was two other men on that bus, two other young guys on that bus that also went through a hard time in life. And I knew this. One of them was picked on so bad that it was unreal. And if I'm being honest, sometimes I was in on it too. I was doing the picking. And when I look back at that, that's my worst mistake. Because those two young men, they're no longer with us either. I found out later that they had both taken their own lives. And when I think back to that time, and I think, I was so scared. I was so uncomfortable. I was so ashamed of God. Amen. A lot of times we think denying God is saying, oh, I don't believe in God. But sometimes when your actions don't follow, you're just like Peter. You're just like denying God. When somebody says, I'm broken and I'm hurt and I need something to help me and you have the answer and you sit there with your mouth shut, you're saying, I don't know that man. I don't know that Jesus that can take care of that situation. I have no idea who can help you. I wasn't with him. I don't know about what God can do. And just like Peter, you're denying him. And when I thought about this, it, it broke my heart. And like Peter, I begin to cry and I begin to think, if I would have done what God called me to do, no telling where those young men might have been. No telling what God could have done through their lives. Now, I'm not beating myself up and I'm not, well, I am in a sense, but, but I, I, I'm not saying that I'm going to give up and then I blame God and then I'm upset. But what I'm saying is you have the chance now. You have the calling now. God can do a work through you now. Don't be like me and make the mistakes and go through life and deny Christ and say, hey, you know, I don't want to do that. I don't want to look weird. I don't want to act weird. Hey, I acted like the world. Amen. When I was in school, I acted just like everybody else. Nobody knew I went to church. They didn't know I was part of an apostolic church. They didn't know I was filled with the Holy Ghost speaking in tongues. They didn't know I had a calling on my life because I was ashamed. I was scared. I was afraid. I didn't want nobody to make fun of me. And I denied Christ. And just like those men in the Bible, I was just like them crucifying God because I could see what he had done I knew the miracles he could do he had worked a miracle in my life he had done things in my family but when it come time to talk about him when it come time to stand up for him I was putting him on that cross just like everybody else and saying I don't know that man I don't know what he's capable of so yeah that's my biggest mistake and I fight that every day I fight that I, I tell the young people in my youth class all the time I regret when I didn't do more for God I regret all of my time in school when I could have reached out to people and I didn't. I was too busy acting like the world. But God has called us out from the world to be in the world, but not to be of the world. Amen. But the story doesn't end there. Amen. My story didn't end there. I didn't get out of the boat then, but I'm out of the boat now. Amen. And I'm not perfect. I still mess up. I still get embarrassed. I still get ashamed sometimes, but I got to get out of the boat because I can't let those mistakes define me anymore. Amen. And I'm here to tell you that just because you've messed up, maybe it wasn't you preaching the gospel to somebody else. Maybe you've done some low down, ragged out things, but just because you've messed up doesn't mean that God has given up on you. I thank God that he's merciful and that he never gave up on me. When I messed up, when I dropped the ball, when I thought God will never forgive me for that. God forgave me. He picked me up out of that and said, I'm going to call you again. I'm going to call you again. You got a chance again to get out of the boat. Amen. And what's beautiful is we see this with Peter. We see this with Peter. Back in Luke 1, or Luke chapter 5, I'm sorry. Back in Luke chapter 5, that sea that they were at, they gave us a name for it. And I can't remember it now. I should have put it in my notes. Genesaret. What's beautiful about the Sea of Gennesaret, it's also called the Sea of Galilee. If you didn't know that, history lesson for you. But after all is said and done with Peter, he's ran, he's abandoned Christ when he needed him the most. Just like Jesus said he would, he abandoned him. How many of us have ever felt abandoned? It's not a good feeling. So imagine how Peter felt to say, I won't abandon you and then abandon him. Peter had already denied him three times. Peter was heartbroken. Peter was upset because he, just like me, he knew better. He knew better. He knew, I said I'd never do that. But I did. And I've skipped all my notes. I don't even know where I'm at now. That's okay, you're doing good. But Jesus, 
He goes through the crucifixion. We all know the story. He dies on the cross. He's buried in the tomb. Peter wasn't there to watch the, the crucifixion. Peter wasn't there to see what was going on. Peter was somewhere in a corner crying. Peter was somewhere in a corner beating himself up. Peter was somewhere in a corner saying, God will never use me again because I've made so many mistakes. God's going to give up on me because I knew better and I messed up anyways. I walked with that man and I turned around and I denied him. I gave up on I left him. When he needed me the most, I left him and God will never use me again. God will never call my name again. God will never want Peter again. I can imagine Peter thinking this somewhere. But what Peter didn't know is God was already working. God already had something going on behind the scenes. When Peter was in his lowest moment, God was saying, I still got a plan for you, Peter. And it's beautiful because you see it in Mark chapter 16. When Jesus is rose from the dead, the angels come to the women and say, in verse 7, go tell his disciples and Peter that he's going to Galilee to meet them. Now, he could have said, go tell the disciples. But just me, I feel like... He made a point to say, when you tell the disciples, you tell Peter too. Because Peter's going to say, I'm not a disciple anymore because I failed him. But you remind Peter that I said, hey, I called him. Remind Peter that I'm going to meet you at Galilee. Remind Peter that although you made a mistake and you messed up, I still want to see you over there because I still got a purpose on your life. Amen. You might be in your corner crying, but God's saying, tell my children, tell my disciples, tell Peter that I'm still going to use him although he messed up. The enemy's going to say, Peter, you're washed up. You're a has-been. You've missed your chance. You missed your boat. But God said, go tell Peter. Go tell my disciples and be sure to tell Peter. Because Peter's hurt. Peter's broke. Peter's given up. But I haven't given up on Peter. So when you've given up, just know God hasn't given up on you. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. The most craziest thing, too, is Jesus shows himself to the disciples on that count of three times. Jesus shows himself to them two times. To the disciples, to Peter, I'm guessing, to all of them. Peter had seen that Jesus had been resurrected. Peter had seen that Jesus was okay after all. But somewhere inside, Peter was still broken. Peter was still hurt. And although they went and said, Jesus said, For you, Peter, and the disciples to meet him at Galilee, you think Peter would be jumping for joy. Because to to me, that's a sign that God had forgiven Peter. But the problem was, Peter hadn't forgiven himself. You know, we're called to love God with all that we've got. That's the greatest commandment. The second greatest commandment is to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. A lot of times we fall short loving our neighbors because we don't love ourselves. Because we define ourselves by our mistakes that we made. And we say, God will never use me again. God, I've messed up so much. I I don't even love myself. I can't forgive myself, so I know God can't forgive me. But I want to tell you, that's a lie from the devil. That's a lie from the enemy. Amen? Because when you ask God to forgive you, he's a just God to forgive you. Amen? And he don't hold it over your head like people do, but he cast it in the sea of forgetfulness. It's as far away as from the east is from the west. And that's as far as you go east, you can't ever go west. Amen? The only way you go west is if you turn around and you backtrack. You backslide. Amen? So if God pulls you out of a lifestyle, if God pulls you out of mistakes, it's not God that holds it over your head and says you're a mistake, you're a problem, you're an issue. If you start feeling like you're a mistake, well, then you must have turned around. You must be walking away from God. Amen? But God went out and he reached Peter and said, Peter, I still got a calling on you. But Peter couldn't forgive himself. God forgiven him. That was over with. That was old news. We're on chapter 2, Peter. You're still in chapter 1. What's wrong with you? (laughs) Peter was still feeling guilty. So just like us, Peter went back to what he was comfortable with. He went back to what he had always known. He always knew how to fish. But now Peter knows that, well, I'm a liar. I'm a denier. I'm an abandoner, if that's even a word. I got a big mouth, but I definitely can't back it up. I'm a failure. But at the end of the day, I guess I'm still a fisherman. I guess I'm still a fisherman. 
People are probably going to look at me as Peter the denier, Peter the liar, Peter the cusser, Peter the, the, the one that just thinks that he's all high and mighty, but he really ain't got it all together. People's never going to look at me the same, Brother Creasy. I'm just poor old broken Peter. God will never forgive me. And he looks at all the other disciples and he says, I go a fishing. Peter was still broken. So he said, I'm just going to go fishing. I've messed up. I'm not a fisher of men. I'm a fisher of men. So I'm just going to go fishing again. That's where the story gets even more beautiful. That's where the story gets great. Because God's got a way of turning everything around. We think God can only turn around certain situations. But God can turn everything around. God comes full circle. Every time, whether we know it or not. And in John 21, it says Jesus comes to the Sea of Tabaris. I guess is how you'd say that. Also known as the Sea of Galilee. Another history lesson for you. And he come to the Sea of Galilee to show himself to the disciples. Just like before. It was the Sea of Galilee where Jesus called them out of the boat. And said, I got a calling for you. I'm going to use you in a mighty way. It's not this anymore. But now here Peter is. Back to what he's comfortable with. Back in the boat. Saying, I'm nothing but a fisherman. Like before, they go out, they fish all night. They're doing what they're most comfortable with, what they knew best. They catch nothing. Peter's got to be thinking to himself, man, not only did I fail God, but I've lost my touch as a fisherman too. I can't even catch fish. I'm just, I'm worthless. How many of y'all ever just felt worthless? You failed God and you think, I'm just worthless. You go to work, you feel worthless. You go home, you feel worthless. And you think, man, I, I've just dropped the ball. I don't even know why I'm breathing. I don't even know why God gave me life because I'm worthless. I feel like that's how Peter was feeling. And I feel that way because I felt that way before. But the next morning came. <laughs> I come to encourage you that the next morning is going to come. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. Amen. The morning came, and while they were out in the sea fishing, and they were out there not doing any good, they look off, there's a man standing on the shore. And the man says, hey, have y'all caught anything? And they say, well, no, we ain't caught nothing. We're just a boat full of failures. We ain't caught anything. We can't serve God, and we definitely can't fish. We're just failures. The man said, cast your nets out to the right side of the boat. Cast your nets out there and you'll probably find what you're looking for. <laughs> and when they cast it down, the Bible says they found a multitude. So much that it should have broke the nets, but it didn't. The net didn't break. And while they were drawing this back into the boat, while they were looking at this big catch that they had, John nudges Peter and says, I think that's the Lord. I think that's Jesus out there on the bank. I think that's Jesus. He's come back to call us again. Amen. I'm here to tell somebody tonight that Jesus is standing on the shore. He's standing on the shore and he's saying, I'm back. I'm back. I'm calling you again. The Bible says G or that Peter jumped off the boat and swam like almost 100 yards all the way back to the shore. And there Jesus was with bread and fish on a fire. And he said, come on and die. Come on and die. Amen. And I believe that God chose the Sea of Galilee the second time to remind Peter of the first time. To say that your calling never left you, Peter. Your purpose never left you, Peter. You think that you're washed up and that you're done, but I'm not done with you. If you would get out of the boat, Peter, if you would get out of where I called you from, if you'd quit trying to be who you used to be and be who I called you to be, I'd be using you right now. Hey, too many of us, we're in the boat. We've gone back to what's comfortable because we failed God and we've messed up and we've got more questions and answers so we go back to what we're comfortable with but Jesus is standing on your shore saying I've called you out of here before you're not a fisherman but you're a fisher of men come and dine with me come and eat with me I know you feel like you're a failure but I want to have fellowship with you I want to use you again I want to call you again amen he calls them children he calls them children that's so beautiful that when we mess up and we betray God, we betray our very Father, He still calls us children. He still says, I'm not going to forsake you. I'm not going to leave you. You're no, I'm not going to cast you away and say, I don't want anything to do with you anymore. I know you messed up, but if you... See, the beautiful thing is, 
The beautiful thing is, and I'm not condoning making mistakes, but the beautiful thing is, is when you make it up in your heart to surrender and you say, I'm going to drop the net. I'm not going to be that fisherman. All those mistakes you made, God can turn that into beauty, pure beauty. And what was brokenness and what was ugly can now be beautiful by the hand of God. Amen. God can turn it around. So I know it looks ugly in your life right now. You got a lot of things going wrong. You've messed up and you have a whole pedigree of mistakes. You have a whole rap sheet of all the things you did wrong. But if you would give it to God, God would turn it into beauty. God gives beauty for ashes. That that's burn up. That's that's, that's no more. That that... that Ashes, you can't make wood back out of ashes. If I was to burn a piece of wood, I can't put it back together, but God can. I can't put it back together, but God can. I can't put you back together. You can't put you back together, but God can put you back together. Amen? So if you want beauty for your ashes, I want you to know that God's here ready to put you back together, ready to call you out of the boat, ready to call you out of what's comfortable. It's time to get out of the boat. It's time to get out of what's comfortable because God still has a calling. God still has a purpose. And I have a scripture in here somewhere. I don't know. Romans eleven twenty nine 29 is what it is. It says that the gifts and the calling of God is without repentance. What's this? <laughs> that don't mean go and live in sin and live like a dirt bag and do whatever you want to do and God's still going to use you. But what that means is when you've made mistakes and when you've dropped the ball like Peter and you've denied Christ and you've pretty much crucified him and put him on the cross and said, I don't know that man. I don't want to have no dealings with him. I'm not going to claim him. I'm not going to say I'm one of them crazy apostolics. I'm not going to do that. When you've made those type of mistakes, God's still there waiting for you. God's saying, hey, if you'd put down that net, if you'd stop tripping over yourself, and if you'd stop putting limits on me, I can use you. That calling is still there. The gifts are still there. You just got to allow God to do it. God's not going to step in your life and yank you by the collar and make you do the will of God. you got to have the want to. As Sister Creasy says, you got to get it together that the enemy is a liar and that you're not defined by your mistakes. You're not who you used to be. And you got to step into the new chapter that God's given you. Amen. I know you messed up in the last chapter, but you got a new chapter. Amen. I don't read much, but I've never read a book and defined it by one chapter. I've never read a book and said, well, that one chapter was bad. This whole book's bad. But when you turn the chapter, when you get to the next chapter, and it all starts coming together, I can't define a book by half of it. But when I put it all together, I think, man, that's a beautiful masterpiece. Hey, we're only looking at one chapter. We're only looking at the mistakes. We're only looking at the bad side of it. But if we would allow God to turn the chapter in our life, you could see the beautiful masterpiece that he's going to put together. He's the author, and he's the finisher. Amen. We might mess it up, but he's going to have the final say so he's going to finish it all out for us if we'd give it to God amen Amen. but I know what you're saying I've messed up I know what you're saying brother Sam and it's easy to say that from where you're at but you don't know how I feel you don't know what I go through you don't know the man that I look at in the mirror the woman I look at you don't know the mistakes that I've made but I got the same for you you don't know the mistakes I made And you don't know what the enemy told me when he said, you're done. You are done. God's not going to use you. You've messed up. Think of all of those people that you could have been saving, but you didn't. And I'm sorrowful for that. But I thank God I got a new chapter. I thank God that that the gifts and the calling of God is without, that that just because I mess up, God's not going to flick me away and say, I'm done with you. But when I mess up, God says, if you just come on back, if you just surrender your life to me, hey, like Brother Creasy said this morning, we got to surrender. We just got to lift our hand and say, God, I messed up. I know I did. But God, if you'd see it in your heart to forgive me, Lord, if you would just wash me clean, give me another chance, Lord God. Call me out of the boat one more time. I'll do it right. Don't be defined by your mistakes. Peter in the boat never thought about being Peter on, in Acts chapter 2. I can promise you that. When Peter was in that boat that day, he never thought, I'm going to be a great preacher. I'm never going to, I, he didn't think that I'm going to go out and preach the word of God. One of the greatest messages ever preached in the Bible. Peter never probably saw Acts chapter 2 when he was in the boat. So I'm telling you tonight that you need to get out of the boat because your Pentecost is around the corner. 
the greatest move, the greatest work God's ever done in your life is around the corner if you just get out of the boat and say, I'm going to drop this that I'm comfortable with. I'm going to drop who I used to be, and I'm going to be who God called me to be. Amen. I'm getting ready to close so you can stand. I'm going to tell you that the enemy is going to fight you. The enemy is going to try to tear you down. The enemy is going to try to tell you you're not worthy. But just remember who called you out of the boat. And just know that God's standing on the shore saying, come on, children. Come and dine with me. I'm calling you again. I'm reminding you that you're not a fisherman but you're still a fisher of men you still have a calling i know you messed up but you could still do my work if you would just surrender your life to me amen peter went on to be one of the greatest disciples greatest apostles whatever you want to call it he preached the acts 238 message he preached hey he preached to cornelius amen you're beating yourself up but God's saying there's a Pentecost. God's saying there's a Cornelius. There's a family that needs to be saved. There's a house that needs you to preach to them. There's children that need God, and they need to reach God, and it's going to be up to you. Hey, if Peter would have stayed in the boat, there never would have been an Acts chapter 2 from Peter. Maybe, maybe there never would have been a Cornelius. The Gentiles probably would have never felt the move of God. They probably would have because it was the will of God. But Peter never thought that he would be that man. He never thought he'd be that man. So I'm here to tell you. I know you've messed up. We all have. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. Amen. We've all dropped the ball. We've all failed God. But there's a whole group of people that's waiting on their day of Pentecost. There's a house of Cornelius that's waiting on the Holy Ghost. There's a family out there that's waiting for you to come and give them the gospel. Amen. And if you let the enemy beat you up, well, then you're letting him win. And we're overcomers. If you're a child of God, and every single one of you are a child of God, you're an overcomer. We're victorious. We don't have to be losers. We don't have to be a bunch of failed fishermen out in the sea, just lost with no hope and nothing coming to pass. Amen. We still have a promise. We still have a purpose. Amen. And I'm here to tell you that tonight, Jesus is standing on the shore, and he's calling you. He's back to where it all started. And he's wanting to put that call on your life again, if you would let him. God will forgive you, but only if you'll let him. So these altars are open. You can, you can come on down. Step into a new chapter. And when you come up here, I don't want you to beat yourself up about the mistakes you made. Now, if you need God to forgive you, you ask God to forgive you. That's what you need to do. Get your heart right. Ask God to cleanse you. But don't come up here. If you've asked God to forgive you of those mistakes, don't come up here and beat yourself up and say, God, I'm sorry. God, I'm sorry. God, I won't never do it again. Because you might mess up again. You're going to make mistakes. But when you come up here, say, God, call me out of the boat one more time. God, use me one more time. It was Samson when he failed. It was all beyond recognition. He had lost his sight. He had lost his strength. He had lost everything that he was known for. But after all of his mistakes, he said, let me feel your spirit one more time. You can feel it again. God can restore you. God can take you back to what he's called you to before. But you've got to allow God to do it. Jesus' name.